let's do another video update and this one we're going to be talking about what happened during the negotiations in Turkey between Russia and Ukraine and this is day one of uh, two days of negotiations but you've had ongoing negotiations as well all this time via video and um, and a couple of meetings in Belarus as well but it looks like we're close to some sort of treaty perhaps a ceasefire a treaty let's see and i'm saying that we're close to a treaty because that's the reports that we're getting from tas which is um the uh state the state media so for them to to put that out there that we are very close to some sort of uh negotiated settlement is meaningful we don't know much but i'm going to try to relay to you what we do know and this is from tas pull out my phone here so I make sure I get everything right and this is from TASS and it says the agenda of the Russian Ukrainian talks includes the issue of recognition by Kiev of modern territorial realities Russian Foreign Minister Maria Zakharova said quote on the agenda are permanent neutrality non-block status security guarantees demilitarization of Ukraine denazification recognition of modern territorial realities, restoration of the status of the Russian language, and the rights of Russian-speaking population. In other words, we are talking about the return of Ukraine to its origins of its statehood enshrined in the Declaration Sovereignty of 1990, Zakharova, st Zakharova stressed. That is important. That last line is really important. In other words, we are talking about the return of Ukraine to the origins of its statehood enshrined in the Declaration Sovereignty of 1990. Now these are uh, there's are some pretty big uh, big demands coming from Maria Zakharova from the Foreign Ministry, Russia, the Kremlin. I I doubt that the Azov uh, Nazi battalions and the far right. Uh, influence the Nazi influence in the Ukraine government will uh, agree to these terms, but that's beside the point. Let's let's get to some of the the details that we do know. And when I say details, I I say this very loosely because we really don't have much right now. But the the big story the big story has to do with the fact that military activity. Um, in, in and around Kiev and uh, Chernikov will be paused, will be paused, will be drastically reduced. I'm looking at my, uh, at, at the article here, will be drastically reduced. And that's a quote. Uh, Russia has drastically reduced its military activity near Kiev and Chernikov as talks with Ukraine enter the practical stage the Deputy Minister of Defense, Alexander Fomin, announced on Tuesday. Big news. This is big news. Speaking to the press following the talks with the Ukrainian delegation, Fomin said that a decision was made to drastically, in several, in several times, reduce the military activity on the approaches to Kiev and Chernikov. Now listen to what he said. To reduce the military activity on the approaches to Kiev, to Kiev and Chernikov. Quote, we expect that relevant key decisions will be taken in Kiev and the conditions for further normal work will be created. Fomin called on Ukraine to fully abide by the Geneva Conventions, including with regard to the humane treatment of prisoners of war, obviously referencing the POW videos, which had a profound effect on Russia society. He explained that this decision was taken due to the fact that negotiations on the preparation of an agreement on the neutrality and non-nuclear status of Ukraine, as well as on the provisions of security guarantees to Ukraine, are entering the practical phase. Key word, they're entering the practical phase. Reduction of Russian forces activity is poised to increase mutual trust and to create the necessary conditions for the further development of negotiations and the achievement of the ultimate goal of agreeing 
and signing the agreement, Fomin said. Now, keep in mind what he said here, because a lot of people are going to say, well, the Russians are retreating and the Russians are pulling back. And I'm sure the narrative from the uh, from the mainstream media on the West will be, you see, Russia couldn't lay siege to Kiev and now they're pulling back and they're retreating. And that's how they're going to present this. That's not the case. That is not the case. That is a lie. What they are saying here is that, uh, and let me pull it up just so we are clear as, as to what uh, is being meant here by the Ministry of Defense. One second. The transfer of the parts of the Defense Ministry of the Donetsk, of the Donetsk Theater of Operations means a reduction in offensive operations on the Kiev and Chernigov front. As the source explained to Radovka, which is a publication, many times I show the maps of uh, Radovka, as the source explained, the latest statements by the Ministry of Defense does not mean the secession of the work of our military and controlled territories. It is precisely about reducing the number of offensive operations our troops will remain in their position in the numbers necessary to carry out new tasks. Everything is being done for the speedy achievement of the goals set by Shoigu, the defense minister of Russia, the elimination of the Donetsk grouping of the enemy and the liberation of the territory of the LDNR. So basically what, uh, what they're saying here is that the military is in Kiev and Chernigov is not going to press forward. They're going to remain as is. They're going to continue to pin down the Ukraine military in Kiev and in Chernigov. In other words, the encirclements, the cauldrons will still remain in place, but they're just not going to press further. There's not going to be any activity to, uh, to press further or to engage with the Ukraine military. They're going to remain as is. That is what they're saying in order to allow for uh, a, a negotiated settlement to take place. Now, keep in mind, the fact that Russia is agreeing to this or the fact that Russia is making this statement that in Kiev and in Chernigov, the activity is going to be reduced, the, the forward activity, the forward military activity is going to be reduced or is going to be paused does not mean that uh, the activity in the Donbass and in the East is going to be paused. I believe they're going to continue to move forward with the annihilation of the, uh, the Azov battalion and the Azov uh, military in the east of Ukraine as planned. So what's going to happen in the east is that they're going to continue to, to grind down the Azov soldiers, while in Kiev and Chernigov, you're going to see a pause in any type of forward military activity while you're also going to be seeing the negotiations and the diplomatic solution move towards what the Russians call a practical phase, practical steps towards an eventual signing, perhaps an eventual signing of some sort of negotiated settlement. Now, let me take you to another, uh, some more statements made from, uh, from these negotiations. Moscow's envoy described the conditions for Putin's talks with Zelensky. There are talks now that uh, Putin may be meeting with Zelensky. And uh, Moscow's envoy said that Russia has agreed to meet Kiev halfway and will allow a meeting of its leaders to be held on the same day that the final version of a peace treaty is pre-approved by the two nations' foreign ministers. Moscow's top negotiator said on Tuesday after a new round of talks in Istanbul. Previously, Moscow had insisted that a meeting between Putin and Zelensky could only be set after the deal would be finalized. Vladimir Medinsky, who is the main negotiator, described the talks in Turkey as constructive and said his delegation had received a clearly outlined position on what Kiev sought to achieve. The written proposal which includes Ukraine's pledge to remain a neutral nation and that it will not try to obtain any weapons of mass destruction, including nuclear weapons, will be relayed to Putin, Medinsky said. David Arakamia, Medinsky's opposite, 
in the Ukraine delegation said Kiev had sought a security guarantee from a number of nations that would work not unlike NATO's mutual self-defense commitment. He named the UK, China, the US, Turkey, France, Canada, Italy, Poland, and Israel as possible guarantors and claimed some of them have given their preliminary agreement to serve in that capacity. The proposed security pledge will not apply to the parts of Ukraine whose status remains in dispute. Arakamia said these include Crimea, which Russia considers its territory, and the breakaway Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republic, which Russia recognizes as sovereign states and whose forces are taking part in ongoing hostilities. Turkish Foreign Minister Kafosuglu remarked that he hoped that the outcome of the negotiations would soon lead to a ceasefire and a sustainable political resolution of the crisis. So, um, Wow, that list of countries that will ask as gar- that will act as guarantors is very interesting, very interesting indeed. Let me find that list of countries again because, you know, if this is accepted, I would say if this is accepted, I would say that this puts Russia in a position of weakness, and here's why. UK, China, US, Turkey, France, Canada, Italy, Poland, and Israel would act as guarantors. Just the fact that a great power like Russia would agree to have guarantors in an agreement is uh, it's quite stunning. It's quite stunning. Usually countries like the United States, Russia, China, I don't know, India, I mean, these countries to actually allow guarantors to... to uh, to enforce the terms of a deal in uh, in conflict resolution is it's pretty it's pretty interesting. I mean, can you imagine Turkey, Poland, UK, the United States acting as guarantors on top of Russia? That would be quite. I don't even know how that would work. It seems like that. It seems like that term, if Russia accepts it, would would be would be a loss in my opinion. Um, I can see Russia maybe accepting from this list. Let's see. China, Turkey, Israel, maybe. But Turkey's a NATO country. I don't know. Uh, with regards to the terms that Maria Zakharova laid out in the beginning of my video, I can't, I can't see the Azov Bandera elements in Ukraine, which yield a lot of power in the government and in the military. I can't see them accepting this. I can't see them accepting the terms that Maria Zakharova, Zakharova laid out going back to how Ukraine was during its founding in 1990. They're not going to accept those terms. Uh, the U.S. The U.S. and the collective West, they may accept the terms, but they're not going to abide by them. I think you have to be very naive to believe that after everything that's happened with uh with a coup in 2004, 2005, the Orange Revolution, with another coup in 2014, 15, with the military buildup, with uh, not abiding by the Minsk Accords, of which France and uh, Germany signed on to, after all these things, to believe that if a treaty is, is agreed upon, if a ceasefire is agreed upon, and um, you have these guarantor states and you have a map where essentially it's Crimea and Donetsk and Lugansk, which are agreed to, to be part of the Russian Federation, uh, to agree, agreed to, to, be, to not be part of Ukraine. Ukraine recognizes that they're not part of Ukraine and Crimea is part of the Russian Federation. Ukraine recognizes that and Donetsk and Lugansk are seen as independent countries and Ukraine recognizes that. It's hard to believe that all the other military gains made by Russia are going to be rolled back and then the 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 state of Ukraine which for the most part remains intact before the conflict erupted that they're going to just um, abide by this ceasefire and once again not have NATO come in and not rearm and not remilitarize and not re-nazify 
I mean, I don't want to be cynical or pessimistic. I want an agreement. I, I would like a, a peace and a ceasefire. I think everyone wants a peace and a ceasefire, but I'm just trying to to figure out how how this would solve the the problem for Russia of Ukraine and how it would solve the problem of Ukraine being a being a hot spot for Europe and for the world and for another crisis to not pop up in four, five, six, seven, eight years. Uh, I'm, I'm finding it hard to, to figure out how this would happen, but who knows? Who knows? Uh, we, th- we don't have all the details either. So, you know, I'm just giving you the details that we've had trickle in right now. And we don't even know if those are concrete details either. I, I wonder how Russian society is going to view this, given all the all the military gains that they've made, all the bloodshed that has happened. I wonder how Ukraine society is going to view this, given all the all the destruction and and, and the bloodshed as well. I mean, you know, what what was Mariupol for then? If you're looking at it from the Russian side, if you're looking at at it from the Ukraine side, they may ask the same: Why? Why did all of this happen in Mariupol for for Russia to just leave again? to just roll back and leave. What what was the purpose of it all? And what was the purpose of it all if we've got a another Minsk-like agreement put in place for which we know that NATO and the US and the EU is not going to honor? I wonder if, if a ceasefire or an agreement is a way for the EU to, uh, to figure out their LNG problem and their oil problem. You know, maybe this will buy the EU some time three, four, five years so that they can say, okay, we have a ceasefire. Now we we can roll back maybe a small part of the sanctions, i.e. the part that benefits the, the European Union, roll back the part that has to deal with gas for rubles, roll that back so then we can continue to get the energy that we need for from Russia for, say, the next three, four, five years while we build up our energy policy to move away from Russia. And then when our energy policy is independent of Russia in four, five, six, seven, eight years, however long it takes, then we can start this all up again. Because Sullivan, in his in his statements he made like three, four days ago, and the neocons and Newland, you know, all these people, they've, they've been very clear. They're not going to stop until Russia is destroyed. I mean, Sullivan said it. This is We see this as a long-term project. That's what he said. The regime change in Russia and the destruction of Russia is a long-term project. And we know that the neocons aren't going to go anywhere because they're in every administration, whether it's Democrat or Republican. You know, they're always in the administration, whether it's Bolton or Newland or Pompeo or Sullivan. And when I mean the neocons, I also mean the neoliberals. I think there's no real difference between those two groups anymore either. I don't think there's a difference between Samantha Power and uh, Victoria Newland. I don't think there's much of a difference anymore. Yeah, maybe Samantha Power or Bolton focus more on the Middle East when it comes to regime change and uh, wars. Regime change, color revolution, humanitarian interventions, whatever you want to call them. But, uh, you know, Victoria Newland, okay, she focuses more on Russia and and Ukraine. But at the end of the day, it's all about Russia anyway, isn't it? I mean, Syria at the end of the day was about destabilizing Russia as well. So at the end of the day, even even the neocons that are focused on the Middle East or the neocons that were focused on Serbia, like Madeleine Albright, at the end of the day, it, it, it all comes back around to destabilizing Russia sooner or later. I don't know how a proposal like this is going to go down with the Russian people. I really don't. I imagine there's going to be a part of Russian society that's going to look at this agreement. And once again, I preface it. If this agreement is uh, is signed, if this is actually, you know, a signed agreement, a signed peace deal, I imagine there's going to be people in Russia's Russian society who are going to be very, very pleased with this because the conflict has ended, and it's been heartbreaking to see uh, Russia fight with Ukraine. But I imagine there's going to be a lot of hardliners as well in Russia who are going to to really dig into Putin for this one. They're going to say that Putin's soft on the West and they ha- that he has a blind spot towards Europe. And he does. Putin does have a, have a soft spot for, for Europe, especially Germany. Um, I think Nord Stream 2 is case in point. 
because a lot of the hardliners were telling Putin, don't go forward with Nord Stream 2. People always got to remember that Nord Stream 2 was a German initiative. Angela Merkel approached Putin and approached Russia and said she wants Nord Stream 2. The big lie in the West, one of the biggest lies in the West is that Putin approached Germany and approached the EU with Nord Stream 2. That's a lie. Angela Merkel and Germany approached Russia and begged Russia for a second pipeline. And there were a lot of hardliners who told Putin, don't do it. They're just going to, to betray us. They're going to cause us problems. This is a headache we don't need. But Putin ha has a soft spot for, for Germany and for the EU and for Europe. And, and he went ahead with it. And, you know, we see what's happened now with Nord Stream 2. So, you know, I'm just throwing a lot of stuff, stuff out there for everybody in uh in the conversation and in the comment section to think about once again this is we have another day of negotiations and uh we don't have all the details as to what's going on and what this uh what this first day of negotiations means but i think the fact that you're getting um articles in tas and uh in rt and sputnik news at least the articles that i can access and, and kind of dig up is uh that are saying an agreement is close is pointing to the fact that an agreement is close because Russian state media would not report on it and would not phrase it as as, as an agreement is, is pending and we're very close to it if they didn't get the okay from the state apparatus. So we're close. We're close to an agreement. And uh, if it is in this type of form or in this type of shape that I just read, read out to you guys, well, I think it's a mixed bag. In my opinion, it's a mixed bag. It's good that we have a peace agreement. It's good that the fighting has stopped. But I have to say, if I'm being completely honest, and uh, if if the territory, if, if the map just kind of rolls back to, to what it was before the conflict, with maybe a little bit of Donetsk and Lugansk, those provinces, uh, maybe those provinces get to keep their territorial gains. But if it rolls back to a map like that, uh, you know, it, 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 it solves the problem of Ukraine perhaps for four or five more years, but uh, I don't think it solves the, uh, the war that has been waged against Russia um, going forward. And uh, I, I don't really, I don't really believe that a lot of people in Russia are going to believe that Ukraine and NATO and the EU and even the guarantor, the guarantor powers are going to uh, honor the agreement. We have to see who those powers are going to be. If, if, if Russia agrees to have the UK or the US or Poland be a guarantor state, then I think <laughs> I, I think the Kremlin's lost its mind, to be quite honest. I have to be honest with you guys. I think the Kremlin lo has lost its mind if they agree to that. China? Okay, Turkey? Ooh, Turkey, uh, to me, is iffy-iffy. Uh, and Israel? Ooh, iffy iffy I mean, those countries could turn on, on Russia, you know, just like that. The turn of a dime, they could turn on Russia at, at any note, at any moment. They could, uh, they could betray Russia. So, I mean, you know, and, and Turkey is a part of NATO, so I don't even know how that would work. It's, it's like having NATO be a guarantor of, uh, of this agreement. And then Russia is kind of saying that they're the weaker party because you're going to have a state on top of Russia guaranteeing uh, Ukraine security guarantees. Don't get me wrong. Uh, Ukraine wants security guarantees, and they have a right to ask for those security guarantees. Um, that's what they're negotiating for. But uh, uh, I'm just skeptical about having states, having another alliance put in place to guarantee Ukraine's uh, territorial integrity. Maybe there's another formula that they could work out outside of alliances and, and having other countries involved. Who knows? Keep in mind that when they mean a guarantor state, they mean that if something happens, if a conflict uh, erupts, and those guarantors uh, have a right to intervene in the country militarily, and they have a right to impose a no-fly zone. Keep that in mind. I come from a country, Cyprus, where we had the same agreement. This is why I'm skeptical. 
we uh, we had an agreement in place. Uh, the both sides of uh, both part both uh, parties involved in the Cyprus conflict and the Cyprus dispute, and our guarantor nations for our uh, constitution, because there were problems. To make a long story short, just to break it down and make it very simple, there were problems between the Greek Cypriots and the Turkish Cypriots, and. Uh, when we got our independence from the UK and we uh, we had our constitution put in place, we had three guarantor nations to guarantee the territorial integrity and the security of Cyprus and of those two communities, the Greek Cypriots and the Turkish Cypriots. At the time, the split was around, say, 85-80 Greek, say, 15-20 Turkish Cypriots. And those guarantor nations were Turkey, the UK, and Greece. And this was an agreement signed in 1960. And 14 years later, in, 1960, in 1974, uh, conflicts were brewing up, and eventually you had uh, the conflicts reach uh, a breaking point, and you had a coup d'etat in, uh, in Cyprus. You also had a coup in Greece take place, and then you had a coup in Cyprus take place. And then you had the invasion of Turkey. And the island has been split ever since 1974. 36% of the island has been illegally occupied by Turkey since 19, uh, did I say 64? Since 1974. And it has not been resolved. So I am not a fan of guarantor powers in these types of solutions. Look, anyway, I think I've rambled on enough and uh, I'm curious to hear your thoughts as to what you uh, think about the proposals that have been uh, leaked out so far. And we'll learn more as the day goes along. I'm sure we'll learn more tomorrow as well. But uh, I have to be honest with everybody. I'm not, uh, I'm very cynical about what I've seen come out so far. And there's a part of me, you know, the part of me wants peace really, really bad. I, would, I want nothing more than to have this conflict be resolved in a peaceful way, but there's also a part of me that says, from a, real, from a real politic point of view, that says, does this really solve what, uh, what's going on? Or are we just putting a pin in Ukraine, just saying, okay, let's, uh, let's put a pin in this, let's kick the can down the road for four or five years, and, and let's uh, change the war from a hot war in Ukraine to waging this economic war between Russia, China, and the collective West. Maybe the rest of the world and the collective West. And that involves de-dollarization and sanctions here and sanctions there and trade wars and tariff wars and proxy wars here and there. Maybe another proxy war in, in the Middle East. Maybe the next hot spot will be in the Balkans. Maybe it'll be in Syria again. Maybe Iran, who knows? And are we just putting a pin in Ukraine for the time being? I don't know. The caucuses, I don't know, everybody. Let's, uh, let's wait for the information to come out and let's see how this all uh, unfolds. Let me know in the comments down below how you see things. I'll leave the video there. Thedoran.locals.com. Take care.